And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Howard Charney, who is here today to share some thoughts from the perspective of the high-tech sector about the 21st century education. Howard Charney is a senior vice president at Cisco. He contributes directly to Cisco's strategy and direction, and he advises educators, businesses, and governments around the world on implementing critical internet technologies to improve productivity and competitiveness. And he's in a very good position to do that. During more than 35 years in the Silicon Valley, Howard has overseen the development and proliferation of key technologies that led directly to the global build-out of the internet. Howard was a co-founder of 3Com, a country whose, te excuse me, a company, or country, whose technologies enabled the internet access to the desktop. Several years later, he founded Grand Junction Networks, which invented fast ethernet and low-cost switching. Cisco was clever enough to buy Grand Junction in 1994, and with Cisco behind them, fast ethernet and low-cost switching and the internet became fundamental and ubiquitous worldwide. You've probably heard or all heard the story about the young musician who is lost in New York City. He sees an older gentleman who is also carrying a violin case and asks him, how did he get to Carnegie Hall? And the old man answers, practice, practice, practice. <laughs> well, when young people ask Howard Charney how they can do what he did, he tells them, education, education, education. Howard holds bachelor's and master's degree in mechanical engineering from MIT. He also earned an MBA and law degree from Santa Clara University. He sits on the board of several technology companies and on the advisory board for the Center for Science, Technology, and Society at Santa Clara University. Um, please join me now in welcoming Howard Charney. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. So um, there's a Chinese expression which goes something like this. Um, may you live in interesting times, but really it's a curse. It isn't really much of an expression of wellness or well-being, really. What it's really about is life's tough. And you know that there was really no way that we could have forecast the Arab Spring. And we do business in 80 countries around the world, and, and we do business in Egypt and Tunisia and Lebanon and uh, not so much in Syria, but we, just before Egypt erupted, I was in Egypt, and, um, and Egypt was on paper a democracy, but really it was a monarchy. And in all, for all practical purposes, it, it was a strong-arm country, but there was no way we could have forecasted that at that particular moment it was going to basically change forever, probably. And so, may you live in interesting times, and there's no way we really could have forecasted that most of the EU is teetering on the, on the edge of economic disaster. It's not really probably going to collapse, but it's really close. And we do business, a lot of business in Europe, and it's tough there. But you know, this has happened before, and as a matter of fact, after the great stock market crash of 1929, journalists asked the famous economist John Maynard Keynes whether anything like this had ever happened before. And they must have caught Keynes at a very interesting moment because his response was, yes, it was called the Dark Ages. <laughs> and it lasted 400 years. Well, the truth is that it may feel like 400 years, but, but life goes on. Now, for centuries, actually, not very much has changed in the world. We, have, we do agriculture a certain way, although my tour yesterday of the university clued me into, yes, we do, but we do it in a different way, and we use science, and it's, it's, it's different. But agriculture has gone on, of course, for centuries. And life has gone on for centuries in a, in a certain way 
and for a very long time, not very much in the world had changed until, until the late 1700s. Now this is a, a graph, you can't really read it from where you're sitting, but it basically plots GDP per capita versus year. And what you'll see is the curve is flat forever. And then in the late 1700s, the curve takes a, a significant uptick. And so something happened in the middle 1700s to the late 1700s and has put us on a trajectory of increasing, seriously increasing GDP per capita in recent years. And one would argue, one would argue that that is technology. Now actually, the work of this particular woman, Carlotta Perez, who is actually a Venezuelan. Now she teaches at the University of Surrey in England, but she's a Venezuelan and she is amazing. And so her work, her work basically has been to, to correlate technological innovation with economic cycles. Now forever co economists have studied economic cycles. That's what economists do. Economists look at housing starts and they look at unemployment rates and they look at the money supply and they look at et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But generally they do not look at technological innovation. They simply don't. It's not what they look at. But she said, you know, this is a mistake. That really, the way we got here since 1771, Arkwright's Mill, was there were certain seminal technological innovations that occurred, and they seemed to occur at a rate of about every 50 to 60 years, and at that rate, everything sort of changed. And so she says we're actually in the fifth major technology revolution of modern times, and I really don't have time to go into the details of her work, but she says the current age that we're in, the age of IT and the internet, began in 1971. What happened in 1971? Excuse me? Hector? No. Yeah, good guess. The microprocessor. The Intel 4004. And she argues that everything changed with the programmable microprocessor. Everything changed. And it basically kicked off a, a, a process. Then, and in her book, in, her, in this seminal work, she describes how the model works. And if she's right, we are about at the middle of the current technology cycle, approximately. And if she's also correct, we have about between two and three or, or one and two decades of economic expansion and prosperity and growth ahead of us. Now. The problem is it doesn't feel like economic prosperity <laughs> and growth and expansion. It feels very bad. But she would say not to worry because these are long cycles and, and day to day it's just unimportant. And so she would say that the age of IT and the internet is here and will transform everything. As a matter of fact, we are in the middle of a structural transformation. And that transformation is affecting everything. And of course, you are the education sector, but it's also affecting manufacturing and finance and healthcare and government, energy, communications, et, et cetera. As a matter of fact, during one, the tour that I had yesterday, I, it was pointed out to me that uh, Southern California Edison, it's not called Southern California Edison, eh? that, that's where they do the smart grid work, right over there. Oh, huh, that's kind of interesting. And so, Basically, that is the grafting of internet technologies on top of what is otherwise a very stupid network, which is the grid. It's either on or it's off in the old days, but in the new days, well, it's a little smarter than that. It isn't always just on or off. And maybe, maybe we won't have to build an incremental power plant because we can use the current capacity we have to supply the needs we have because we can be much smarter in the way that we use our resources. So, everything is changing around us and it is basically a major structural transformation. And so what's happening is the network is increasingly becoming the platform for everything. And it's, it's a little different if you're a business and it's yet a diff different world if you're a consumer. And of course it's also a, a different kind of a world if you're a thing. 
And you might say, what did he just say if you're a thing? Well, we speak now. You see, you're all connected via your cell phones, and it's pretty interesting how you're connected by your mobile devices. But the world of tomorrow is about what we call the Internet of Things, where things are connected and things communicate with other things, like, say, a bridge. A bridge is smart, and it tells us that the condition of its structure so we don't have to go look necessarily. And so that bridge that, say, fell into the Mississippi a couple of years ago in uh, Minnesota doesn't have to fall into the Mississippi. And the bridge that replaced it is, in fact, smart. So the network is becoming the platform for all manner of communications. Now, one of the indices of the network is becoming this platform is the proliferation of broadband. And we used to say that, the in fact, we measured we, 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 uh, we have a, a, a barometer a, that kind of measures, in fact, it does measure the penetration of broadband in different countries of the world. And one of the metrics we use is how, how much has broadband penetrated your country? And say in South America, the penetration is pretty small. In Finland, it's, well, it's off the map. But the Finns are different. Now, actually, all of Scandinavia is different. I can, trust me, it's different there. It's, anyway, but, but in some places of the world, it's, uh, penetration of broadband is very meager. Well, I used to believe, before this uh, World Bank report, I used to believe that if we, if we increase broadband penetration, we will improve the quality of life and the standard of living for people. And in fact, that's true. But in 2009, the World Bank came out with a study and said, every 10% increase in broadband penetration increases economic growth, GDP growth, by 1.3 percentage points. Now, understand how significant that is. How much is the United States going to increase economic or GDP? What's GDP growth going to be this year? Two and a half points? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Two points? How much is China going to be? Seven, maybe, something on that order. What's India going to be? I don't know, whatever, six, a little less, but not that much less. But, one, but the message here is that 1.3 percentage points of economic growth is huge. It's absolutely gigantic. Now, I used to believe that only applied to undeveloped countries. It doesn't apply to developed countries. Wrong. If you actually read the report, the World Bank says not true. It's a slightly smaller percentage of growth for 10 points of, of, of uh, broadband penetration increase, but not manifestly different in a developed country than an undeveloped country. Very, very interesting. So broadband penetration is a significant factor in global economic development. Now, so there's this great wave of technology adoption in the world today. I, I don't want to read this slide. It's just, it's just not worth it to read the whole slide. But basically, there's, there's these vectors in the world. And individually, say, the um, number of enterprises who are going to have deployed or will deploy cloud-based computing resources, eh, that's just a number. But taken in the sum total of all these vectors, they basically tell us something. And they tell us something that the world is changing and the technology is, is permeating our lives in a very, very significant way. And any of you who want to bet against it, I'll take that bet. You can't stop it. It's impossible. It's inexorable. It is coming, and you just can't stop it. I just finished reading this book. You can slow it down. The Amish have been successful in slowing down the, I'm serious, the adoption of technology. Not stopping it, just slowing it down. But you cannot stop it. So, there's these major shifts that are driving change. And you can think of today's students as being centric to, to, the, to the issue, if you will. There's, there is uh, shifts in globalization. You know, we, we don't manufacture anything in the United States. And that's not a political statement. It's just the reality. It's, it's just what we don't, we don't do that. We don't do that because we can't be cost competitive. We simply cannot. And so if you'd like this business, which employs 65,000 people and has revenues of 40 billion, if you'd like it to close down, 
Well, that's, I guess, one outcome, but we don't want it to close down, so we have to be competitive, and the competitive metrics have to be global. They cannot be local. They cannot be regional. They must be global. So globalization is a major trend. There are changes, major changes in demographics. You know, it used to be that we were it. Well, guess what? We ain't it anymore. There's this country called China, and there they may be it. And if, even if they're not, when you look at China and you juxtapose it with India, that is 2.3 or 4 billion people of this planet. They have a much better chance of being it than we do in the future, say. Also, when you look at Carlotta's work, she doesn't speak about what the sixth major technology revolution of modern times will be. She kind of evades that question, and the reason is because there are some things that are unknown and unknowable. But if you look at where the latter, let's see, the latter three great technology, major technological advances of modern times came from, they came from the United States. It will not portend well for us if the sixth major technology revolution of modern times occurs in China. Because what has gone on historically from those changes has been great economic growth. That would be a bad thing. Now, we'll, you know, I'll, I'll be retired then. <laughs> Anyway, so today's students, and of course we have a technology acceleration going on, so today's students have a different world than when I went to school. It's just very, very different. Also what's going on today is their world is just so, so dislocated from the world that I kind of knew. Their world is, it, it, it is populated by all these different inputs. Um, we were talking at lunch about Skype, and, but eBay and, and Google and iTunes and Amazon and all these other influences, they come to you basically technologically competent, I guess you could say. They're certainly different. They, they carry these devices with them. The proliferation of smartphones is, is, is very high. And they basically come to you with all of these influences, these external influences and sources of inf information. And the university, for sure, is a major source of information and a change agent in their lives. But you know something? The sum total, in fact, it was, on, it was in the video about teamwork. The sum total of what everybody else knows is much larger than the sum total of what we know. It has to be that way. In other words, outside is a lot more information than inside. And that's what they're basically accessing. They are accessing outside. And that's a big change, a huge change. And this is what their world kind of looks like. So I have this colleague who says that to compete in the current world, you really only need three things. You need a good idea, a good education, and a good internet connection. To some extent, there is, a, um, there is some truth to, to that. Perhaps it's an oversimplification, but you know, we live in a, in a world of oversimplification. But certainly, you need information. So there is another. The Chinese are very smart, incidentally. The Chinese say, give a man a fish, and you, and you feed him for a day. But I change that a little bit. Teach a person to use the internet and they will not bother you for <laughs> weeks. And it's, it's really, really quite, quite true. So, what does this really mean for, for educators? Well, what this means is that there's this set of rising expectations about the demands that students make. There's a market velocity and technology that is, that is encouraging that market velocity. Innovation is everywhere. You can get access to anything, anytime, anywhere. It never turns off. I mean, it's, it's, just, it's just available continuously. And then there's these financial pressures, and the financial pressures uh, are, are real. Now, it's kind of hollow to simply ex exhort uh, people to do more with less. It's, um, 
it, it just doesn't, it doesn't work very well. In fact, W. Edwards Deming taught us that about uh, exhortations. And Deming said, avoid exhortations. And do you, you know who I'm talking about? He just avoid them, right? Be smarter. That doesn't work. Uh, be higher quality. That doesn't work. Um, don't, don't have accidents. That doesn't work. You can't really exhort people to change. But having said that, there are major financial pressures, and we do have to do more with less. And the only way to really do more with less is to interpose technology as a tool. And it's, it's just the only card that we have. But it actually turns out to be a pretty powerful card. So, ah. so let's, and again, this is very consistent with what went on earlier today. We have to harness the power of participation. We have to be forward thinking so that we have to bring together our faculty and staff and students and community members. Now, incidentally, this breaks the wall of the university. And this is a little hard to get your head around because it is not a university that has a, I mean, it does have titled land, but it's really beyond the walls of the university because when we start talking about community members and we start talking about partners and other key constituents, well, then it is a sort of a, the notion of the university as a global entity. And that's sort of what the thinking is today. It is the most aggressive thinking, and it seems to be where the, where the concept of the university is going, and I'll talk more about this. Well, let's see here. Oh, yeah. Right, and students are at the center. Let's one more now. Come on. Now, how come this is not working? Okay, do it manually. It's probably not. You're right. Uh, Click it. Yeah, click it. Why not? Yeah, this will this will work. So, okay. So now you're doomed to having to sit there. Okay, fine. So, we we come from this world, and it's the world that I went to school with, there within, where you had this this bricks and mortar structure, and I mean the place where I went to school wasn't that pretty necessarily, but but. Now, the way, that, the way that the university is conceived is, is as a virtual, but as well as a bricks and mortar facility. And one of these, this is not an either or, this is really an and thing. This is an and matter. It's not really a, a matter, in fact, I had this conversation. It's not really that one, one um, sort of thinking is going to dominate the other. That is not what's going to happen. What's going to happen is the world of tomorrow is this blended mix of wired and wireless. It's this blended mix of virtual as well as masonry. It is, in fact, a, a different world, but it's a kind of an extension of the world we have. It is content intensive. It will be video intensive. It will permit collaboration. It will absolutely be location independent. And it will be device independent. That's another thing, you know, in, in some cultures of the world, these devices that people carry are changed like fashion accessories. I'm serious. They are changed like fashion accessories. Uh, I, I want a blue one today. I don't like the pink one I used to have. And in fact, that's very true in Asia. So the, the, the end user device is actually unimportant. What is important is the content. And you people are in the business of the of providing content. Actually, that was in a presentation that was made, I, the feedback was received that that wasn't exactly right. We're not actually in the content purveying business. We are in the learning business. And so whether you want to make that gloss on it and say, well, it's not exactly content. It's learning. It's that thing. And that's, that's, a, that's a different world for tomorrow. And that, this is what that world is going to look like. Next one. So it becomes much more a student-centric approach. And what is in the center is the cloud. Now, the cloud is, in fact, that place where that data 
that you are speaking about is stored, and I don't care where it physically resides, and you don't care. All you care about is when you go to that location, it's there. If it's not there, that's very bad. Very bad. But in the modern era, what's at the center of all of this is the cloud. So I sit and I give presentations and I watch these people and they have their iPads in front of them. But if the network goes down, those iPads are worthless. They're totally useless. They do nothing. So the world of tomorrow is cloud-centric and it involves digital signage so that it knows when a certain student passes by this particular place, it flashes a message that the class that you thought were, was in room 103 is now in room 102. It knows who they are. That's called near-field technology. It knows we, we have very high-quality video, and so the Skype that, that we were speaking about earlier is just makes me cringe because it's very low-quality video. Now, we sell low-quality video because it's inexpensive, and you just put it on your, a PC and it works, but it's really not a very good um, example of, the, of what the technology is capable of. That little graphic is, is beautiful video, and beautiful video is, um, is amazing because when you actually have a conversation with someone over, we'll call it beautiful video, HD video, something which is very high quality, you don't know in about three to five minutes that they're not sitting with you because the sound is perfect. It's, and the video is, is excellent. It's HD. But it also involves mobility because people are not tethered. And any concept, and this is very bricks and mortar like, any concept that somebody's tethered is a mistake because they're not. It involves collaborative tools. It involves video as well as web TV. And it involves libraries that are bricks and mortar because I, I, it, I was taken to your library yesterday. And it is bricks and mortar. But it's also very much digital resources. So this world of tomorrow is much more complex than one teacher and, say, 32 students. It's one teacher, many classrooms, say, just for, for one thing, one comment. Now, you might ask this question, well, where does, where does he get off telling us how to educate? I mean, this, this, this institution has been here, and he's not even an educator, which is true. However, what, is, what you must understand is that it just, just so happens that the company that I, I work for is one of the largest, largest distributors of content globally. Largest. And we, we started a little over a, a decade ago this program called the Networking Academies program because there simply weren't enough competent network engineers and network administrators in the world, and we knew we could plot that there was going to be this, this skills gap. And the only way that the skills gap was going to be able to be surmounted was we had to train a lot of people globally on how you build networks and how you manage them, or else we're not going to sell anything. It's going to be a real problem. So we, we created this curriculum. And so it is a specific curriculum that we wrote. And we have networking academies in the US and in South America and in Africa and in um, sub-Saharan Africa and in Europe and in uh, Asia as well. And it's a very large program. Next one. How large a program really is this? A million students engaged in learning this year. A million. A million. That even dwarfs Cal Poly Pomona. And it dwarfs Cisco, too. Four million students have been touched by the program to date. And you, can just, you can read this, the statistics. We have a million online assessments that are delivered every month. Because the program really doesn't work unless you tell students what they, what they well, you test them. It, it's being tested continuously. And I'll come back to that in a second. But they're being tested continuously, and when they don't test well, well, then the, the, the software automatically takes them back to where they needed to remediate. It's very, it's very thought through carefully. Now, you might think, that sounds pretty draconian, or maybe it could be draconian, I guess. But I have visited some of the poorest areas of Santiago. And I have visited some of the poorest areas in Kenya. And you cannot, if you don't kick these students out of the lab, and there are labs, they won't go home at night. It's a game to them. So, so just the fact that you provide assessments doesn't seem to squash enthusiasm. They think it's this gigantic computer game. And then they learn how this stuff works. It's really quite, uh, quite amazing. Next one. 
So what's it about? It's about virtualization and simu simulation. It's about the use of gaming, which we've only recently implemented. It's about social media as a tool to connect the students all together. And it's about all of these assessments. And so there's interesting, interesting profiles and interesting technologies that are used to provide this kind of information. Now, I mentioned to you that there are labs. Every one of these networking academies has a, uh, a teacher. And the teacher actually uh, works with the students and, and um, gives them guidance because the material is, is only the material. But it, it's very interactive and it's extremely, uh, uh, if you will, encouraging as I watch these teachers work with the students. Sometimes they're in um, uh, vocational colleges and sometimes they're in high schools, but it, it doesn't really replace bricks and mortar. It's the bricks and mortar gets supplemented by another form, if you will, of content delivery. And so that was a, that was a conversation that we had earlier, which was, no, 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 no. The bricks and mortar are not going away. They're simply not. But there's other paradigms that will be brought to bear, and you will not be able to stop it. Now, so, so this is one form, if you will, of contribution. Give me the next slide, please. So we said, you know, this is kind of neat, and this need for, for, for people in a learning environment to collaborate is important. And so we said, you know, if you were going to create a platform whereby people were able to share information, they were able to launch video conferences, they were able to access internet information, and they were able to do this, say, from a, a, a simple place, what would that place feel like? And so we wrote this piece of software. And we could have called it Cisco Piazza, but we didn't. We called it Quad. And so it's just a, it's a platform. It's a piece of software. And now you could write this software yourself if you wanted to, if you had about 10 mil and, I don't know, a bunch of people who weren't occupied. Because I know you have an engineering school that's supposed to be very good. And um, you, know, you could write it, but it probably wouldn't be worth your time and your effort since we already did that. So what's Quad? Quad is a mechanism in an educational environment for people to collaborate. It's not the only answer, but it, ten, it, turn, it turns out and it tends to be an environment that is um, uh, very successful. So let me click again. So what does Quad really do? Well, it enables all these interactions. It, enable, it gives you a personal, personal dashboard. It allows tagging of information, which is most important to you. It allows you, with a single click, to make a call, send an instant message, to meet somebody on video. It's, you can read this stuff. Now, sometimes I've been asked, well, look, this is really great, but why don't we just use Facebook? We could do that, right? We could just use Facebook? Uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. Facebook is legion and notorious for having security problems. And you cannot afford that. University systems and the mechanisms by which people collaborate has to be secure. It just has to be. And so if you're going to use a platform for, say, tutelage, and then collect information about that, about what you learned and how successful you were at learning, it has to be secure. Just like the grade systems and the mechanisms that you use to, to uh, evaluate where people have been and where they're going has to be secure. And unfortunately, Facebook isn't, even though it is free. And free is good. I like free. But it just doesn't work. So, so it, it allows you a bunch of things and all kinds of teams that you can, that you can establish on the fly and people that you can send messages back and, to, back and forth to and you can, send, you can enter blogs and you can do unified communications if you want. It's pretty, it's pretty spectacular and it's also pretty deep. Is it the only thing that you could use? No, but it's a pretty darn good example and it works, works beautifully. Now, so look, you don't have to invent all this stuff yourself is kind of the message here. If there's no reason. In 2011, there's been a lot of, of pioneers who have spent unbelievable amounts of money. I mean, we're one of them, but there's other places, other universities that have spent lots of money trying to decide where is all of this going. Let me give you a, couple of, a few examples, just a few. Next one. The Tech de Monterey. The Tech de Monterey, now, I, today, I, today the company wouldn't let me visit them. It's not a safe place. But I was there. 
And the Tech de Monterey is a leader in the delivery, the remote delivery of content, two-way delivery of content. And they, they started out doing, using cable TV and satellites, and now they've progressed to the internet, and they have this beautiful studio in Monterey, and they um, deliver class material, and the professor, I, I watched this, the professor sits there, and yet there's five other classrooms. Remember one teacher, many classrooms? This, the, the professor or teacher is there, and then he calls or she calls on somebody, and they're at the other side of somewhere, the other side of Mexico, or they're in somewhere in LATAM. Most of the content is delivered in Spanish. In fact, they're probably the leading uh, content provider of Spanish-speaking uh, content in the world at a university level. The tech is impressive, very, very impressive. Next one. Duke is also pretty impressive. Now, Duke has implemented a lot of technology. They've, they've, we've been working with them for a while, and they use technology as an enabler. They use this very high-quality video, which we call telepresence, in lecture halls so that they can break down barriers between people and between remote areas. Many of their classes are automatically transcoded and transcribed. They use Quad as a, as a collaboration environment, as I described to you earlier. And it basically allows them to scale their MBA programs around the globe. Um, they're very proud of what they've done. And so I reiterate, there's no need for you to, do, to, 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 to be a pioneer and get arrows in your back. These people will talk to you about what they have done, and they will share with you the kinds of things that worked for them and the kinds of things that didn't work, which is very valuable, extremely valuable. Next one. And then there's West Texas A&M, and they believe in video all the time. Maybe you're getting the, the, um, the message here. Video is really, really important. It is, if there's one paradigm shift, that's, that has occurred in the last decade. It is the uptake in video. There is, no, there is no accident that YouTube is one of the most hit sites in the world. YouTube alone comprises a huge percentage of the bandwidth that, that service providers carry. And so West Texas A&M believes in pervasive video, all video, all the time, and you can read what it says. And there's many different video systems in the world, and we happen to have developed some technology, which happens to be called MXE, which makes video platforms from different sources able to be exchanged gracefully. It works beautifully. And so they're very proud of what they've done. And they're actually, it's pretty, it's pretty impressive when you, when you talk to them. So, next slide. So you have these big challenges, but you also have these huge opportunities. Click again, please. You can both drive as well as benefit from a transformation which is technology driven. But it requires the right policies and the right technologies, but you actually can obtain a competitive advantage by uh, using them. And so different people are finding out that they need to change. You need to change, or that change is going to run right, right over you. And it won't stop. It will just run over you. So then I get asked very specifically, OK, what is it that we should do? Click again. And so you need to assess infrastructure, because I was asked this question, I get asked this question more than once. If we did what you said, would we bring the network to its knees? Probably. Probably. OK, so fine. That's not a, that's, that, that's not a big deal. We just need to determine what you have and what, how it needs to change to be able to handle all this extra traffic. Big deal. It's just not that complicated. Click again. You need to build on the assets that you already have. You know, we happen to have written curriculum to teach kids, they don't have to be kids, but to teach people how to be network um, administrators and network engineers. But I don't know squat about chemistry or whatever, lots of things I don't know about. But you do. You could write that content. And the same engines that we use to teach people how to be network administrators could be used to teach people to do something else. It's just not that tough. Again, you need to revisit the, the notion of the classroom. University walls are just that. And those walls are basically coming down. 
and your students expect that they could take a class at Duke, say, online in the summertime, say, and then they want to come to you and, and say, I, I want credit for this class I just took. I took this class, differential equation, see, and I got a B. I wanted credit. And you say, we don't have any mechanism to do, well, I don't know what you say. But basically, the wall of the university is no longer a wall, and the students expect it to be that way. They expect you to be there, but they also expect the walls to, to melt. They want you to, you need to optimize your policies and procedures for a 21st century kind of education. We're not talking about a monastery, we're talking about the 21st century, and it's going to be a different place. You need to partner. You need to partner because nobody has the complete answer. We've spent a lot of money and we've written a lot of software and we sell a lot of infrastructure, but we don't have every answer. And there's, there's, there are other really great partners in the world who have other technologies and they have other uh, ex, uh, kinds of expertise and you need to determine who those partners are and you need to determine what you can get from them to, to improve the quality of the product that you deliver. It's just that simple. And last, you need to have a vision. This cannot, trust me, this cannot occur accidentally. You will not get there if, if it, this is a matter of, of accident. You must determine what's the vision, what are the decisions, strategies we say are decisions that you make to obtain a competitive advantage, but it doesn't have to be a competitive advantage. They're simply decisions that you make. They're boundary conditions in mathematics. You cannot solve mathematical problems without boundary conditions. These are boundary conditions. What are they? Those are called strategies. You need to determine what the execution is going to be in conformance with those strategies and that vision, and then you have to measure the result. And if you do that, it's really not that tough. It can be done. So let me just leave you with, with uh, a statement from Seneca, a Roman philosopher who lived a very long time ago. And Seneca said, the fates guide those who go willingly, and those who, they, who do not, they drag. Thank you. Do, do, you want, do we have time for a couple of questions? Yeah, well, I, I only want softball questions. I, I don't want hardball questions. <laughs> Sir. Well, so this is, that's a really good question because the whole notion of a university, this is not just Facebook, it's the notion of openness, the whole concept of the commons. Uh, this is a place where we share. This is not a place that's locked down. It's not a prison. It's a place of sharing. And so the, the locked down in nature of certain kinds of sharing or information flies in the face of what is frequently considered to be one of the bastions of, of, of the beauty of the university, as well as the founders of Facebook wanted that sharing because they monetize that sharing. So they come from this perspective of you want to share everything about yourself and your family and where you were and where you're going and your thinking, and we'd like you to. And it is in that sharing that the concept of security, they know about this, of course, the concept of security is anathema, kind of, sort of, because it wants to create walls and lock things down. And begrudgingly, they permit you to, begrudgingly is the wrong word, they permit you to do that and create affinity groups, so to speak. And so what you need to determine, there's certain things that are, in, are, are, are not negotiable. Your financial systems, they're not for sharing. Your grade systems, the systems by which you determine what courses students have taken, what grades they've obtained, where they're going, what programs they're in, you can't allow that to get hacked. This is not for sharing. This is for us. We have to have it. It has to be secure. But there's a lot, all, there's a lot else that, that can be shared. So there's this delicate balance, and the university is one of those, is a difficult environment. In the corporate world, we don't have this problem. We just say it, and it's, it will be so. But in the university environment, you have to... You have to define what's open, what's part of the commons, and what's not part of the commons. It's that simple. Yes, sir. Uh, there should stop the now with the successes in using technology. So you know, visits to uh, different universities uh, who have tried experiments, 
Have you also learned some examples of failures that we maybe should uh, watch out in the application of a technology in higher education? Yeah. <clears throat> so one of the one of the errors that people make is w when you introduce technology, the first thing people think of is, I I was doing this process manually. Now because I have all this computing power, I can do it in an automated way. That's a mistake. So that's one of the things we have learned along the way. Basically, what you need to do is uh, uh, implementations have failed where people have simply automated manual processes. But where people have stood back and said, what's the objective in the long run? And let's not worry about how we used to do it. Let's think about how we get to that result. Then the processes might change. And so we, there are some really glaring examples of failures along the way, which was simply the implementation of this set of books. You see, here's this set of books. And we now we just, we just put them on the web. That's it, right? Wrong. That's not just it. So yeah, we've learned some things along the way. And, and you know, the literature is complete with all kinds of, of best practices as well as your, your question is worst practices. But the most glaring that comes to my mind is the automation of manual processes using computers that fails. With uh, Cal Poly Pomona, with industries, could you care to share some models and some examples of that? Sure. So we we've collaborated, but we're not the only one. You know, we we may be big and we may be important, and you know, we employ a lot of people. But there's lots of companies out there, and so there are collaborations that are possible. Now, incidentally, yeah, you you, I'm I'm the closest thing that works for this company that's an academic. And I sort of step aside from this ruthless capitalism that got me to where I am. And I sort of look at this in a little more of a detached way. And when you look at it in a more of a detached way, you'll see that there are some companies that have really grand technologies, really grand product offerings. And yeah, you, you know they want to sell you something. But that's OK. You know that. And so Apple is, is a wonderful example. They've got really cool stuff. I mean, it is so cool. And they will collaborate with you, but they're endpoint devices generally. They're basically not the network. And then there's us. And then there's who knows else, uh, AT&T. There's a bunch of different partners. There's Blackboard. Like We don't make uh, course management systems. We don't do that. But there are course management systems out there. And so if you have an idea of what the vision is, and that was that last slide, our vision is Students come here, and they spend a certain amount of time here, and then they spend a certain amount of time online, and they take classes here and there. And, and this is how we, they get, we get them from a tabula rasa to someplace else. And then you can determine what are the critical pieces that are needed to fulfill that reality. And maybe we're part of that. And maybe Apple's part of that. And maybe Blackboard's part of that. And maybe somebody else is part of that. And so the answer is, the, it's possible to do that, but you have to be in charge. You can't let somebody else tell you we're the answer, because there is no single answer. And also, the universities are different. Cal Poly Pomona is different than Channel Islands, for example. It's just different. And so you're, you know, you're, you're a different environment. You're heavily ag. And it's, it's just, so you have to decide, ah, this is how we wanted to feel to go to school here. And these are the partners who play really well. You know, it could be that Bayer, Bayer Ag, which is a very big company, they would, they'd be a great partner for our ag department. I don't know that that's the truth, but possibly they invest millions of dollars every year in, in agricultural developments. And uh, so may, maybe. So anyway. There are, there's, this, there's this cloud, if you will, not just a cloud in the, in the um, web sense, but there's this cloud of participants in the world who are there, and some can help you and some won't. And then you have to decide who are the best ones to partner with you, and then you go to see them. Don't wait for them to come and see you. You say, I want you. And, they, and you'd be surprised. The, the reception could be really positive. <laughs> Another question? 
Yes. just an amazing job with that. Um, one of the things that there's been a struggle with over the past few years is having students uh, access various technologies, multimedia, video, uh, to present their scholarship, what they've learned, and mix media together and present it to their students, which is very empowering for them. They get this sense of being uh, accomplished and becoming experts in particular areas. One of the things that we're struggling with is not only teaching students the digital literacy pieces of this, but also once these pieces are created, where are they stored and how are they accessed? And I'm curious in your work with other institutions how some of those things are being leveraged and, and sought and you know, discussed. I'm not exactly sure if I understand the question. So there's, there's, there's tools that people use to express themselves their creativity. Then you also said where they put that creativity. There was a very big movement to, to put things out there in the cloud, which is a really good thing. Because trust me, you don't want all that equipment. You don't want all those data centers. And you don't want all those power bills. So I'm not exactly sure. There's a very big movement to uh, away from, like for example, applications that reside on desktops that live out rather in the cloud. That also takes the cost down by maybe a factor of between four and five. You know, there's some interesting, there's some interesting paradigms here that, you know, I remember I said doing more with less and avoid exhortations, but there really are some really cool ones that allow you to do more with less. Using the cloud is one of them. Uh, access to storage, you know, for, for you to build gigantic, one of, the, one of the illnesses in which we live is we store everything now. So in a sense, this is a double-edged sword of what, of what Tina was talking about. You realize if everyone keeps storing everything that they create, there's, there is so much, there is such a requirement for, for storage that it's, it boggles the mind. Well, so we now, go, we now believe the best way to deal with that is to put it somewhere else, not at Cal Poly Pomona, but you make arrangements to put it somewhere else. And that's actually a very smart thing. You relieve yourself. So I'm not exactly sure if that's the answer to the question, but there's tools that people, get, people learn to use that are, uh, um, what's the right word, that permit collaboration, that permit sharing, that permit uh, a, a, an expose of what they've accomplished and shown their scholarship. And then there's the storing of that information and the ready access to that information. And they're different. But there's this big movement away from end user devices you know, when I was in your library yesterday, it appeared that some students have their own machines and some don't. And the ones that don't, where, do they, where are they going? Well, they're going to the cloud, basically. They're not. That machine is generic. It's dirt ball, and it doesn't matter. They're going somewhere else. And that's a good thing. You want them to do that because it's backed up, and it, it's never lost. And so there's a lot of different alternatives for that. So there's different, those, those are part of the technological vectors I was talking about a little bit earlier. It's complicated, but that's okay. That's why you get paid as much money as you get paid to figure this out. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your kindness.